Okay, it is 6.35, let's get started. Okay, everyone, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, we're really excited to present Discovering Stained Glass in New Orleans with Dale Carlson. Um, just to get started, I'm Amanda Fallis. I'm an archivist at the City Archives at the for the City of New Orleans. Um, we're very grateful to have not only his book in our collection, but available at several of the libraries for checkout. And his book is Stained Glass, New Orleans, A Field Guide. Tonight, he'll be telling us about his experience. Um, there's a lot of like really fascinating information about the, uh, the, the artist that created the stained glass, as well as like where it is, where it ended up, and many more things, and also some great photographs. Um, let me introduce Dale really quick. Um, Dale is an author, photographer, and architectural historian, and he was born and raised along the shores of Lake Michigan. He developed a fascination with the city of Detroit and studied art, journalism, and graphic design at Michigan colleges. Um, we're very excited to um, have him tonight, and um, he's also the author of a couple of other relevant books, uh, including Corrado Parducci, A Field Guide to Detroit's Architectural Sculpture, Kahn's Detroit, A Field Guide to Albert Kahn Designs of the Metro Area, and of course, tonight's book, Stained Glass of New Orleans, A Field Guide. Um, I will like post a link to your website later in the uh, presentation, Dale. And with that being said, let's get started. We are excited to learn. Hey, thank you so much for the introduction, Amanda. Hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming tonight. My name is Dale Carlson, and I am, in fact, the author of Stained Glass New Orleans, a field guide, which I published in early 2022 after working on it for about two years. Uh, I've been invited by the New Orleans Public Library to lecture to you all tonight for just under an hour on my experience uh, writing this book and share with you a lot of the fascinating things I learned along the way. Uh, before I get started, though, I would first like to thank the New Orleans Public Library for inviting me to present, and Amanda Fallis, who handled most of the technical angles putting together this presentation, uh, Patty Andrews and Pam Tanner, are uh, people that educated me a lot about history of glass in the city. They ran uh, tours for the Preservation Resource Center for many years. And Cynthia Courage, Milton J. Pound, Samuel, and Samuel J. Corso are all uh, contemporary stained glass makers uh, in Louisiana who spent a lot of time helping me out and uh, adding to my additional knowledge of the area stained glass scene. So thank you to all those folks that uh, uh, helped me put this together. I am going to break down my lecture to you tonight into seven sections. I'm going to start off with a short bio of myself and how this book came about. Uh, and then we're going to take uh, a short look for the sake of people in the audience that aren't from New Orleans, uh, look at the history and geography of the area, but it's going to be really short and sweet. We're going to take a look at some classic uh, makers of, of stained glass and some contemporary makers, the ones whose names I just mentioned a second ago in my round of thank yous. We're gonna look at a handful of transplants and replicas uh, that exist in the New Orleans metropolis. Some of those are really fascinating. And we're also gonna take a short look at top collections. Uh, we're gonna finish it off with a, a, a small series of Detroit connections I discovered over the course of my studies. And those were some of the most fulfilling uh, things I ran into over the course of writing the book. And we'll finish it off with a Q&A. Uh, you can write your questions in the uh, comments section above, I believe, and uh, Amanda will keep track of those and ask them afterwards. So let's start off with my bio and how I attained my expertise in the field of architectural history. Uh, my interest in architectural history began in the early 90s when I left my boyhood home of Traverse City, Michigan, to attend college at Michigan State University in a larger city, uh, East Lansing. And back then I had a lot more hair. And one of my favorite things uh, that I loved to do uh, when I was uh, in, living in East Lansing for the seven years I was there was drive to Detroit almost every weekend to take in the city's really groundbreaking and uh, fastly expanding techno and house music scene. And as a bright-eyed youth visiting the big city regularly for the first time in my life, 
I was definitely struck by the epic scale and proportion of the constructions I was witnessing as compared to my modest uh, hometown of Traverse City. And that really stuck with me. And architectural history, it became kind of a hobby of mine for about 15 to 20 years. But I started taking it a lot more seriously in the early 2010s, around 2012 specifically, when I met a guy named Einar E. Kavarin. He's a former Detroiter that lived here in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and now lives in uh, Phoenix. He's Icelandic by descent, which accounts for his slightly uncommon name. And Einar, over the course of uh, an online correspondence we shared, he eventually revealed to me that in the 1990s, he hunted down a son of Detroit architectural sculptor Corrado Parducci. And this son allowed him to photocopy Corrado Parducci's original studio ledgers and a scrapbook containing over 700 images of sculpture he created over the years. Well, as soon as I heard about these ledgers, the gears of my mind began clicking and I decided I wanted to write a book about this guy. He's a very well-known name in the annals of Detroit architectural history and no one had yet written a book about him. And I felt a slight responsibility to do something important with this uh, research material that had fallen into my lap. And interestingly, Corrado also has a New Orleans angle. Uh, his brother lived down here from about 1923 to about 1929. And uh, his brother's uh, connections down here helped Parducci actually secure a few uh, commissions down here. And one of the specific commissions that he secured was an addition to Jesuit High School in 1950, in the early 1950s, with Wogan and Bernard as the architects. And if you've ever driven down the Palmyra Street side of this building, you may have noticed these sculpted Jesuit mission, missionaries in the pediment. Well, there's also some sculpture inside. And to be able to photograph it, I had to make friends with some of the people who work here. And one of the people I made friends with is the former director of alumni affairs for Jesuit High School, a guy by the name of Matt Grau Jr. Matt lives in New Orleans. Actually, he lives on Carlson Street, which is kind of a happy coincidence. Well, I kind of made friends with Matt over the course of uh, seeing the inside of his building. And when I came to New Orleans, in uh, uh, January of 2020, right after I released my book about Parducci, I had a dinner with Matt and gave him a free copy of my book and said, hey, Matt, I've been really getting into photographing stained glass recently, at which point Matt said, oh, really? Well, you need to come back to the high school. You need to photograph our original chapel that was transplanted from the old Jesuit high school campus that used to stand where Père Marquette stands. Pear Marquette Tower now stands in the Central Business District. I took him up on his invitation, and I had already decided on this trip that I wanted to write a book about something in New Orleans while I was here for the three months I had planned. And it was at this moment that I decided, you know what? I need to uh, put this idea into motion by writing a book about stained glass in New Orleans. So these are the very first examples I shot for the book. Uh, and I really had a great experience photographing this chapel that led to uh, this great outcome. Uh, which is uh, Stained Glass, New Orleans, a field guide. So that gives you guys some ideas of how I attained my expertise in uh, the field of architectural history. Now let's move on to our subject for the evening, uh, which is the stained glass of your area. And to uh, acclimate some of the folks that aren't from New Orleans that might be in the audience, I wanna talk just a little bit about the geography. Uh, first, let's look at my coverage area. And uh, there's a few uh, locations in here that might be considered outliers. Hammond is probably the most uh, not New Orleans place in, in, my, uh, uh, in my book, but the stained glass that I found there was just so dramatic that I just couldn't leave it out. A convent going far down the river road towards Baton Rouge there along the Mississippi. It's a little bit more justifiable in my opinion because so many people come to New Orleans as tourists but end up exploring this part of uh, Louisiana uh, and the uh, plantation history that is so prevalent uh, in that area. Also, a lot of Catholics in the New Orleans area will head out to the uh, Manresa House of Retreats there uh, sometimes. So uh, it is pertinent to the New Orleans experience in my personal opinion. Uh, zooming in a little bit closer now, uh, we see that uh, uh, the red dots, they outline the city limits of New Orleans. A lot of people are surprised to know uh, about New Orleans East, which goes pretty far east of the city, but also that there's sections of New Orleans uh, known as Algiers and Old Aurora that are technically on the west bank of the Mississippi River. And even though this area is 
east of downtown. A lot of locals refer to it as the West Bank because it is technically the West Bank of the Mississippi. Pretty much every suburb you see listed on the map here, it's with the exception of maybe Bridge City, Wagaman, and Seabrook, they have a representation uh, in my book uh, at some place, and we'll cover a few of them tonight. There's also an important history lesson that I need to tell you all if you're not from if you're not from Louisiana that you might not know. And that is that building a Protestant church here was essentially illegal up until about 1803 uh, when the Louisiana Territory was absorbed into the United States. That doesn't mean there weren't Protestant denominations present in Louisiana. There were, but they worshipped in private homes for the most part. So uh, this gives the Catholic Church a way bigger foothold in uh, Louisiana than perhaps any other state in the Union. And in fact, Louisiana is the only state that still refers to uh, what we call counties as parishes. And that is a holdover uh, from the Catholic dominant. And who makes the best stained glass? Well, in my personal opinion, it is most definitely uh, Catholics. And we are going to cover quite a few Catholic churches uh, tonight. And there's many covered in my book as well. So let's start off by looking at uh, a trio of classic makers. And when I say classic, what I mean is that the founding uh, um, name for the company, that person died in most cases over a century ago, sometimes a few decades ago. And we are going to go right back to the campus of Immaculate Conception Jesuit Church in the Central Business District of New Orleans, which is a church that still stands and was part of the campus that the old Jesuit high school uh, uh, came from. Uh, they tore down a bunch of that stuff to accommodate Pere Marquette Tower, but the church still remains, as many of you know, and it has a stunning stained glass uh, collection inside. Uh, a lot of the stained glass is elevated, though, and it's difficult to get a look at any corporate insignia if they exist at all. So although we know that these makers, Kutcher and Rothwi, I'm guessing that's the pronunciation of Le Mans, France, and Franz Mayer and Company of Munich are present, I can't tell you for sure who made the exact windows you're looking at at this moment, but it is a great example of a Meyer. Uh, this church is a great example of a place where Meyer windows are, in fact, installed in New Orleans. Uh, so Meyer has a contemporary by the name of Zettler, and these two companies are often talked about in the same breath because they're both based in Munich and the existence of these companies overlaps. And even though they're technically competitors, they're also collaborators on many levels over many, many decades. And in fact, uh, a Zettler descendant marries into the Mayer family or vice versa, depending on how you look at it. And, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Mayer company eventually absorbs Zettler. So even though they're technically competitors, I like to cover them at the same time. You see all these maker's marks we have at the bottom of the screen? Those are all from Zettler or Mayer installations uh, in New Orleans. And one other really interesting thing they have in common, the windows they design in their corporate offices actually get manufactured at the same location, which is the Royal Bavarian Stained Glass Manufactory also known as the Royal Bavarian Art Institute in Munich. And we can even see that corporate name uh, reflected in one of the central right uh, uh, logos that we see in this collage of makers marked. Uh, uh, probably my favorite example of a Zettler design in uh, the city is St. Alphonsus Catholic Church in the Irish Channel. This is an area uh, that has at its height three might even be four Catholic churches that are all right near each other and they all, you know, appeal to a different language group. I believe there was one that spoke Italian, one that spoke French, and one that did maybe English or German. I can't remember that history for sure, but it's uh, two of those churches, three of those churches still stand and uh, they're all really beautiful and all three are included in my book. Uh, these also have really dramatic uh, maker's marks on them uh, that you saw in the previous frame. Uh, St. Mary's Assumption is also in the same group of uh, churches. I can't remember which language was the dominant language here, but uh, St. Mary's Assumption maybe is a little bit better condition in the interior, and I think that's uh, reflected in this photo. Another fantastic uh, collection uh, by Zettler in the Munich style. And uh, if we go uptown a little bit uh, down St. Charles Avenue, we'll find a handful of Meyer uh, designed windows at St. George's Episcopal, which is uh, built in 1899 and designed by a guy that I think has an amazing first name for a Southerner, Southern R. Uh, Duvall. 
But uh, there's a variety of windows in this church. And although the Franz Mayer windows are pretty easy to identify by their corporate insignia, uh, the other uh, makers in the church are less uh, less known and, and not certain. Uh, getting a little bit more modern in their output now, we have a mid 20th century church in uh, Mandeville on the north side of the lake designed by Philip Picazal, another significant architect of the area. Uh, uh, yeah, of the era at Our Lady of the Lake Catholic Church. I think you can see how they're kind of uh, um, getting some more modern looks uh, with the, uh, the windows there. There's also a fantastic uh, four horsemen of the apocalypse window uh, at this church that doesn't really translate well to photographs because it's very long and thin, but that is really worth checking out if uh, you make it out to this area on a Sunday. Uh, closer to uh, the city on Bonnebelle Boulevard in Metairie is St. Catherine of Siena Catholic Church. This goes up in the mid-1950s. And uh, these windows are actually attributed to a specific artist uh, uh, working uh, for uh, mayor at the time. I believe his name was Braun Miller. I should have put it in this slide, I'm sorry to say, but uh, you can learn more about that history by uh, checking it up in my book. And uh, another church in Metairie with just a single mayor window uh, is St. Christopher, Christopher the Martyr on uh, Derbigny, Derbigny. I'm not really sure how New Orleanians pronounce it, but it's another Cazal design. And this church is dominated by Cavallini designs in the Dal de Vert style. Uh, and this is the only leaded uh, stained glass window you'll find here. It's a really interesting six-sided design. Uh, it's up in the choir loft. Uh, we're now going to move on to a second classic maker by the name of Emil Frey. Emil Frey's company dominates Catholic Church uh, uh, stained glass in New Orleans for probably about a century uh, and still has a foothold here to this day. Uh, the founder obviously passed away almost a century ago at this point, but uh, there is still Le uh, Frey uh, leadership, descendants that uh, work with the company to this day. Uh, so Frey probably is in more church buildings in New Orleans than any other maker. And Frey is from Munich and makes uh, his class in the Munich style, but his studios are primarily in uh, St. Louis, Missouri, although I'm told that he did have a, a Munich stu studio for a time as well. Uh, his earliest installation, uh, not earliest installation, I'm sorry, the oldest church in which his glass is installed to the best of my knowledge in the New Orleans area is St. Patrick's uh, in the Central Business District. This is a skylight clerestory window, so it's uh, pretty high up there, but it's uh, really dramatic, these multiple panes that alternate between uh, uh, non-painted and uh, painted designs. Uh, St. Augustine in the Treme neighborhood of New Orleans. Uh, it is originally built in the 1840s, but it gets a massive uh, remodeling and pretty big alterations to its original design uh, in 1926, around 1926, which is the same time that these uh, uh, these uh, windows are installed. And it's a series of saints here primarily, and they're really, really beautifully rendered. Uh, St. Vincent de Paul uh, in the Bywater is actually now known as the Blessed uh, Francis Xavier Silos. Uh, but Vincent de Paul's its original name. It's got a collection of, oh, I want to say 16 of these uh, radius windows that also depict saints and uh, figures from the Bible, naturally. Uh, and I think these might be among the prettiest uh, email fray designs you'll find anywhere in New Orleans. St. Stephen Catholic Church on Napoleon Uptown uh, has a collection of uh, multiple makers. The window you're looking at uh, right now does not have a uh, maker's mark on it. Excuse me one second. So I can't give you a 100% degree, that, uh, a guarantee that this is an email Frey window, but it is in the Munich style and it is very representative of uh, you know, the designs Frey is making during this era. And I believe it's most likely a Frey window, but uh, to, the best of, uh, to the best of my knowledge, Franz Mayer windows exist at this church too. So uh, there is, does exist that possibility. They definitely have similarities, both tracing the style uh, in which they make windows back to Munich. Mater Dolorosa, way uptown. Uh, it's by one of my favorite burger joints uh, in New Orleans. I can't recall the name of it right now, but uh, I am reminded of it every time I think about this part of town. Theodore Brune, the architect, he's pretty significant through this era of New Orleans architecture. 
Uh, it's built to just before 1910, and it has a collection of, I want to say, about 10 of these radius windows with, uh, you know, uh, originally uh, original art depicting biblical scenes for the most part. Uh, St. Francis of Assisi, another really nice uptown Catholic church. Uh, pay attention to the name of the architects here, Dibble and Owen, because they're pretty prominent in New Orleans, and we're going to talk about them uh, one more time over the course of this lecture. This church has started, church has started in 1914, but because of war, uh, World War I associated shortages, they're not able to complete it until 1921. And again, another really nice collection of uh, strictly uh, uh, fry windows in this church. I'm, you'll have to excuse me if I pronounce his name Frey uh, some, once in a while. Fry is actually the correct pronunciation, but I called him Frey for so many years before somebody corrected me that it still slips out now and again. Another uptown destination totally worth uh, taking a look at and stepping inside if you never have before is the National Votive Shrine of Our Lady of Sucker on State Street. This is a Burton and Bender Nagel design built in 1922-1923. The main sanctuary has almost all uh, Emo Fry windows, but behind the altar you'll find a few uh, Franz Mayer windows that were transplanted from the previous shrine. Uh, St. Anthony of Padua, and I always get a kick out of remembering my visit to this church because the priest, I referred to him as St. Anthony of Padua, and the priest instantly corrected me, and I've been uh, using the correct pronunciation uh, ever since. But uh, take a look at the architects again. We're looking at Tol Toledano, Wogan, or Bernard once again, and this uh, partnership is going to come into the lecture uh, one more time towards the end, and it's going to be quite important. Another collection of, I believe, about 10 uh, radius windows here at this church, all uh, with original art depi depicting primarily biblical scenes, if I'm remembering uh, correctly. St. Henry's Catholic Church uh, is not used too much anymore. It's, uh, this parish was absorbed by St. Stephen some years ago, and uh, apparently they only open this church for you know, special occasions these days, but they've got a great collection of uh, fray designed I designed uh, radius windows as well. And look, we've got Colonel Allison Owen of Devil Owen as the architect again. They're very uh, uh, prominent church designers at this time in New Orleans. Uh, we can't forget about our Hebrew friends on St. Charles uptown. Temple Sinai has a great collection of uh, email fry glass. And you'll note that it's less uh, narrative than what we've seen in the Catholic churches. This is because... Uh, in the Jewish tradition, uh, there's more kind of a constant, uh, a focus on not having golden caps. And for that, that kind of reason, you don't see as many people or uh, uh, things from reality depicted in their windows, and you see more uh, uh, patterns. That's, that's kind of liberalized in the modern era, but it is kind of a holdover from uh, prior traditions. So generally speaking, we don't see narrative windows at uh, uh, synagogues uh, in the New Orleans area, but we do see some uh, really gorgeous stuff as that is evidenced by this photo. Uh, again, a really important group of uh, architects here. Three different architectural firms contribute to this church's design, uh, each one more important than the last. Weiss, Weiss Dreyfus and Seaforth, for example, designed the Capitol in Baton Rouge. Uh, here is the last entry of Emil Frey Designs in New Orleans. This is St. Paul's Episcopal, uh, pretty far up Canal Boulevard on the on the lakeside, built in the mid-1950s. And this uh, is a church that also has an, an elementary school attached to it. And I was doing most of my research during the COVID era, so it was very, very difficult to get permission to get inside. Uh, but once I got this night shot from the outside that was backlit, I pretty much gave up on trying to get on to the inside because I knew this was going to be uh, the uh, uh, window I used for my book. Apparently, there's quite a few other makers present at this church, but I do not have a photo archive of, uh, of their collection, as I do for so many other churches in New Orleans. So go looking hard online, uh, you can actually find an article specifically about this window and email phrase contribution to a New Orleans stained glass legacy. Let's move on now to a name that probably all of you know off the top of your head, and that's Tiffany Studios of New York City. And they are unique among stained glass makers in that they have a product line that is not uh, comparable to other stained glass makers. Most of the other stained glass makers, if they branch out into other industries, it's usually, you know, interior decor or 
uh, ecclesiastical decoration at church, specifically sculptures or mosaic work. But uh, Tiffany, they're into jewelry and pottery, enamels, home and office decor. I mean, still related, but uh, uh, definitely a wider product line than we're seeing by most makers. And we've got a bunch of great examples in New Orleans, uh, some of which almost were lost over the centuries, but luckily uh, were found. So uh, both those makers, Mark, you see there came from uh, windows that I photographed in New Orleans. I believe the green one came from one of the very bottom frames of this first example that you'll find inside Tilton Memorial Library at Tulane University. And this is probably my favorite Tiffany example in town for one primary reason, and that is the glass is in a window for which it was originally designed. You can't say that about any other Tiffany in uh, New Orleans. They've all been transplanted. This uh, building is uh, designed by the important architects Paul Andre and Albert Bendernagel and built right at the turn of the 19th to 20th century. Uh, at the Myra Claire Rogers Memorial Chapel at Tulane University, built in 1976, we'll find a collection of, I believe it's about six Tiffany windows here, four uh, radius windows, uh, a rose window, and I believe there's one other example, but I can't uh, say for certain. It might only be five windows. And they all are originally installed in the chapel of Newcomb College in the Garden District, between 1894 and 1911. And this is a building that's been torn down now. Now I did a lot of research on these windows and where they moved to from uh, uh, after, after this chapel was torn down. And Tom Friel of the Woldenberg Art Center or the Newcomb Art Museum at Tulane tells me that some of them were lost for quite a few decades and rediscovered when Tulane's football stadium was being old football stadium was being torn down in the 1970s. So some of these were almost lost to history but they've uh, been reinstalled since. Uh, this is my first Detroit connection, and I'm uh, this I'm kind of uh, jumping ahead here because I'm, we're not going to get to those later. But some of these uh, concepts do overlap, and we do have a really great comparison to make here between the rose window at Tiffany. I'm sorry, at Merrick, Myra Claire Rogers Chapel in Tulane, and we're going to compare it to a rose window in my area in a suburb of Detroit known as Ypsilanti at their first Presbyterian church. Now, this church is originally built in 1857, but it undergoes a massive redesign and uh, a renovation in 1898 to 1899. And this is at the time, at this time, when the Tiffany window is installed. And if we take a look at the health rating on the outside, we'll see that the similarity is absolutely uncanny. These could have come out, you know, off their, af off their production room floor within days of each other, uh, for all we know. I think that uh, the... Uh, Similarity is plainly evident just by a glance, though. Uh, some more Tiffany transplants you can find at Woldenberg Art Center in a section of uh, the building over there that was added in 1995, 1996 with installing these windows in mind. And these, again, were originally in the chapel of Newcomb College in the Garden District, torn down many decades ago. And uh, we see the resurrection depicted uh, in this window. In the other triptych window features the uh, supper at Emmaus. Uh, I believe I did uh, uh, almost get the exact date on this one, uh, installed at, at the Newcomb College uh, Chapel uh, in 1896. It's just a fabulous, fabulous collection of Tiffany's uh, in New Orleans uh, to find if you, have, if you care to take the time to, to seek them out. Let's now look at some contemporary makers. Uh, these are three uh, major presences in the New Orleans area in the field of stained glass making that are still alive and still making uh, designs. We're gonna start with uh, DeFore Carso Studios. They're actually located in a Baton Rouge. Uh, the founder, uh, Paul DeFore, passed away in 2007, but his partner, Samuel J. Corso, uh, soldiers on. And uh, he's had some pretty uh, recent uh, uh, significant installations that we're gonna cover here in a second. We see their sign signatures on uh, different windows uh, from installations I photographed over the course of my uh, experience writing the book. First one we're gonna look at is the uh, St. Joseph Chapel at the Menereza House of Retreats in Convent. And this is a chapel that was constructed inside a much older building when it was renovated in 1987. And Dufour Corso uh, was a, uh, commissioned to create two stained glass windows here, and they were executed uh, by Samuel J. Corso. Also on the campus of uh, 
of the Manresa House of Treat Retreats, we have the Sacred Heart Chapel, which is a standalone small chapel that's been there since 1859. It's a pretty uh, ancient building. And they again commissioned uh, Dufour Corso to create stained glass for one of the buildings in 1989. I've always been curious what the original glass here may have looked at uh, looked like, but I've, I've never found a historical evidence that uh, shows me uh, its appearance. Uh, in Covington, on the north side of the Lake Pontchartrain, uh, we have Christ Episcopal Church. Uh, they have a newer uh, main church building they built in 1967 to replace their old church, but that is also represented in my book. And Paul Dufour executed this uh, rose window around that time, and uh, Sam, Samuel tells me that uh, it's intended to mimic the appearance, the very stylized appearance of uh, pine needles because there's a lot of pine trees uh, there, right there on their campus on the backside of the church. Another uh, really lovely Dufour design. Uh, this is in Hammond. This is one of the windows that compelled me uh, to include Hammond in, my, uh, in what I consider to be New Orleans suburbs. Uh, this is a, a, a little uh, addition that they made to their old church in 1975. And we've got some really hyper modern designs here that uh, I think still look great. Uh, you know, uh, 40, 50 years after they were uh, designed. Uh, our last uh, contemporary, oh, not our last, our, our second contemporary maker we're going to cover tonight is a guy by the name of Milton Pounds who operates out of Covington. Uh, Milton creates windows in the Dal de Ver style, which translates literally to slab of glass. And these are the kind of stained glass windows that use much larger, much thicker blocks of glass. And they're held together by a matrix of epoxy or cement, unlike typical leaded stained glass that is held together by, uh, you know, a lead lining known as came. Now, Milton, he doesn't sign his windows, so but he's also a sculptor. And I was able to find the signature you're seeing here uh, on one of the sculptures at, uh, uh, at the uh, a mausoleum at Lake Lawn Cemetery, the uh, cemetery just north of Metairie Cemetery. So let's look at some of Milton's designs. I also interviewed Milton uh, quite a few times over the course of writing the book, and he's a person that's very concerned with uh, longevity and technical uh, expertise uh, when installing this kind of art, something that he talks about a lot, and I really uh, came to respect his viewpoint on those issues. This is at Algiers United Methodist Church, built in 1920, 1921 on the West Bank there. Uh, and uh, these windows are actually installed Oh, I believe it was in 1979. I thought I had a note on this uh, page that that uh, said so, but I'm not seeing it there now. Hopefully it's hopefully it's not cut off somewhere there. Oh, well, there it is right there. 1979, this is a second example. And most of the radius windows in this church are in uh, this style. That's, uh, you know, some people I think uh, don't give Dal Ver as much respect as it deserves. But Milton is really one of the people uh, who showed me that, you know, it takes as much artistic uh, expertise as uh, creating a, lead, a leaded window. Uh, there's really no question about it in my mind, having learned so much about it from him. Uh, at Metairie Baptist Church uh, in Metairie, we'll find some very similar designs that are installed in the middle of the 20th century. I'm sorry, they're installed around 2000 in a church built in the middle of the 20th century. But uh, Milton tells me his favorite designs are a little bit more uh, abstracted and uh, I would say maybe a little bit more quote unquote artsy. Uh, here's an example at uh, uh, Aurora United Methodist Church in the old Aurora neighborhood of New Orleans built in 1975. And Milton managed all these uh, installations as well. His uh, studio was uh, expert in that kind of work. Uh, another example on the east side of the lake in Slidell built in 1977. Uh, St. Mar Margaret Mary Catholic Church, one of the very few churches uh, I include in my book for which I was unable to identify uh, an architect. There's really, I consider, a super progressive, a fun, interesting, unexpected design on the uh, interior uh, that you're looking at now. Uh, but I think in all my interviews with Milton, he really gave me the impression that this might have been his favorite uh, local installation. This is at St. Philip Mary Catholic Church on Kawani Avenue in Metairie. This goes up in the late 1970s, and there's six uh, windows of this size that circle. This is a, uh, the, the sanctuary. This is a church in the round. And these are probably about seven feet tall and 20 feet across. So it's uh, pretty dramatic uh, when you're inside the church looking at all six of them 
uh, when they're backlit by sunlight. I just have two examples there. And now we're going to move on to the last contemporary maker uh, that uh, is uh, also, uh, uh, he's, uh, he's based in Baton Rouge, Stephen Wilson. Stephen Wilson is uh, in his 80s. And to the best of my knowledge, the last time I looked on it, he's still uh, making he's still making glass. If I'm wrong about that, please, and somebody knows, please let me know uh, in the post uh, lecture comments. Uh, Stephen has a lot of installations in the New Orleans metropolis. Uh, one of my personal favorites you can find at Covington Presbyterian Church, uh, and this is commonly known among people that study Stephen's work as his earliest church installation in the metro area installed in 1982. And I'm told that the reason why is because his parents attended this church. Well, this is a pretty darn progressive futuristic looking design for what is otherwise a somewhat conservative congregation. And the pastor tells me that some of the older people in his flock, they refer to it as Surfer Jesus, which I found absolutely hilarious, but I do absolutely love this window uh because it is such an early example uh, by a significant maker that's still with us uh, in the city limits of new orleans at st charles avenue presbyterian you'll find near the back of their campus set off st charles a little bit uh their uh their sunday school building built in 1923-1925 well they applied a really uh interesting renovation to it in 2012 that gave us these uh curved uh, sections where the uh, ceiling meets the wall which i absolutely love and just gives it this really futuristic look and you know i just feel like i'm in a spaceship gazing at the heavens or, or creation when i'm uh, inside this room and i hope you guys get a similar feeling i just think it's an amazingly a modern room for being such an old building and that uh wilson's window designs complements it perfectly i really love this room i highly recommend you give it a look if you get to this part of town uh, while the church is open Moving now to the north, north side of Lake Pontchartrain in Mandeville at New Covenant Evangelical Presbyterian Church. We have a more subdued uh, set of windows. I believe there's, a, I wanna say eight Lancet windows of this nature and I, uh, one more rectangular window, but it's been a while since I've been there. So don't, uh, don't quote me on that, but definite, definitely significant stuff for uh, giving a close look. Uh, in Slidell, we find out that uh, Wilson is also capable of making Dell Dever windows. And there's quite a substantial collection here, really interesting stuff. I did come across one newspaper article that claimed Fred Wagner, the architect, collaborated with Wilson on this job. But I was never able to interview Wilson personally over the course of my research harvesting. And uh, I can't say for certain that's the case. It certainly would be interesting if it was, though. Back to the Menreza Retreat Center in Convent. Uh, we have the Holy Name of Jesus Chapel. It is inside a building that, to the best of my knowledge, was designed uh, to look old. You see these rip weathered bricks in the background. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, they're from a 1999 to 2001 construction that was uh, uh, built in this fashion intentionally, which is not uh, you know, without precedent. Real nice Stephen window, uh, Stephen Wilson windows there too. But my favorite Stephen Wilson installation is without a doubt, uh, the window you've been looking at behind me my entire lecture, and also the window you see before now that you will find at Holy Ghost, the new Holy Ghost Catholic Church in Hammond. And this window more than any other window in Hammond is what compelled me to include Hammond in this book. Uh, this window is a supposed, is a, a, I believe intended to uh, show a, a creation scene. Uh, it's about uh, 16 feet high, maybe 40 foot across, so it's really epic. And there's another one of the exact same size on the opposite side of the sanctuary that has some uh, references to uh, Noah's Ark and, uh, you know, animals uh, of land and of sea. And there's a lot of stuff to find in these windows if you take a few hours to look at them. This the kind of design that we're, you're always finding something new to discover, which I just absolutely love. So, oh, you know what? Stephen Wilson wasn't the last contemporary maker. Attenhofer stained glasses, but uh, Attenhofer's, we're going to concentrate more on their transplants and replicas, but they do have some original work around town as well because they've got their hands in a lot of uh, different uh, things in uh, New Orleans and Louisiana. This company is founded by a fellow named Ken Attenhofer in the 1970s. 
and it has been owned and operated by its current owner, Cynthia Courage, since 2002. And Cynthia just gave me a ton of her time over the course of the writing of this book, and I'd like to thank her profusely uh, because it was really super generous of her, as so many of the other people that allowed me to interview them over the course of writing it. If you look closely at the uh, uh, the maker's mark on the lower uh, right-hand side here, we'll see Cynthia Courage's name uh, along with some fellow creators at her studio. And it was right around this time that uh, uh, Cynthia took over uh, the company. And this maker's mark comes from this window at Grace Memorial Episcopal Church in Hammond, which is a very old building built in 1876. But uh, they had a window destroyed by Katrina and they got a replacement made by Attenhoffers in 2002. Uh, another uh, interesting installation uh, fabricated by Attenhoffers was in fact designed by a different designer. And this is a rare case where we find the evidence that uh, the designer and fabricator are not the same company, which happens occasionally when you're studying this kind of thing. The designer is a uh, New Orleanian by the name of Ruth Gollywus working in conjunction with the Alon company at that time. And the designs she created are actually executed in the studios of Attenhoffers around 1982 and also installed uh, at this church around that time. That's in River Ridge, in case I uh, didn't mention it. So we're going to transist here now to transplants and replicas, where I believe Attenhoffer's expertise is really uh, super, super impressive. And we're going to start off at the St. James African Methodist Episcopal Church in the uh, Tulane Gravier part of town. Uh, this is a really old building built around 1850, but it gets a, a, a new pediment in 1903 designed by Dibble and Owen. And uh, for those of you who don't know, when you see the initials AME on a church, that generally means African Methodist Episcopal, and it generally means that it has a mostly African American congregation, as is the case with this church. And when I had the uh, chance to uh, photograph the windows inside, I was really blown away. Uh, when we look at the lower sections here, this is really kind of common art glass, but it's really old. The origins are unknown, but what really blown me away was these replicas we find in the upper art section. You see those three sections of the arch there that come to a point? Those were fabricated by Attenhoffers, and they were fabricated based on historical precedents of the previous window found in these churches. And Cynthia Courage, she shared with me a few examples. You see at the top there, we find a window that has a, a GAR logo on it that is completely faded. And this necessitates, uh, you know, the new glass being made. And this is an example of where they can see barely what used to be on these windows, but they can see it good enough that they can fashion a new window from the old design. Now, what really turned me on about these windows and what I love about the most there is those initials, G-A-R. And I'm guessing some of you are Civil War buffs and knows what, know what that means. That means Grand Army of the Republic, which is what the Northern Army was referred to during the Civil War. And the Northern Army soldier, some Northern Army soldiers were actually garrisoned here at this church in New Orleans during the federal occupation immediately following the close of the Civil War, and the occupants in this church during that time were uh, afforded greater freedom to uh, worship in the way uh, they so chose. And somewhere along the line, they created a moral memorial to the Grand Armory of the Republic uh, to put up in their church. And it is unbelievably rare to find a memorial for the Grand Army of the Republic in a former state of the Confederacy. So I was absolutely blown away when I ran into, the, ran into these. And the uh, preacher of the church knew quite a lot about the history and educated me on exactly why it was there uh, right, while, right while I was in the church. Uh, this is a replica window you'll find at St. Teresa of Avila uh, on Arado Street over by em Emerald's Old Restaurant that, uh, on St. Charles that closed up. I'm so sad about that. It was one of my favorite restaurants in town. But uh, the reason it's a replica is because uh, it got destroyed by Katrina. The original was designed by Zettler, uh, who we covered earlier in the lecture. Uh, Attenhoffers actually managed the installation, and that's why uh, they're involved in this particular uh, commission. And it's barely noticeably any difference you can find here in this window from the original when you look at uh, uh, historic records. So this is just a really uh, interesting uh, replica situation. Uh, a, a transplant, a great transplant situation, we'll find at uh, St. Marie's Catholic Church in the Ninth Ward, which is a church that was deconsecrated after Katrina due to low attendance. 
uh, and they left the windows in the upper level, the clerestory windows, which you can see from the outside. But the uh, lower level windows, uh, they got transplanted to a suburban church, and that is Most Holy Trinity uh, in Covington on the north side of the lake. This is built in 2016, and Attenhofer's managed the, you know, uh, uh, the deinstallation, the reinstallation, the cleaning, and you know, the renovation of this glass before it was reinstalled. And I just feel like they did an amazing job with glass that was most likely uh, uh, fabricated in the late 1800s. Uh, Cynthia tells me they were never able to find a single maker's mark on any of these panes, so we can't tell you for sure. Uh, who they're by, but uh, they certainly are interesting examples. Uh, the former two radius windows you saw, you saw there depicted saints. Uh, this uh, triptych design here uh, portrays Mary as Our Lady of Fatima. Um, this is a vision that was uh, had uh, by some children in, uh, in Europe. I can't remember exactly where in the uh, early 1900s. Pretty famous story, though, if you uh, care to look it up. Uh, not only did they have tra glass transplanted from St. Maurice to Most Holy Trinity, they also fabricated an original uh, rose window, which I really enjoy because to me, the outer pattern work, the outer pattern work there, it's very reminiscent of the uh, dome window you, dome window you found, find at Jesuit High School. So I thought that was really cool. Uh, my favorite uh, transplant story and possibly one of my favorite stained glass stories in all of uh, New Orleans is centers around Holy Trinity Catholic Church in the Maroney neighborhood of New Orleans. Uh, this church is built in the 1850s. It's ancient. It was recently deconsecrated due to low attendance, and uh, it was converted to the Maroney Opera House. Well, around the time that that conversion was made, the glass on the lower levels was taken out and transplanted to a new location. But let's look at the upper level glass first that's still present at this location. I can't tell you who the maker is here. Uh, it hasn't uh, come across uh, that uh, information in any of my research, but I can tell you they're very cool designs from around the turn of the century and we date them by the inscription there that you can barely see on the bottom, uh, 1908. The lower level windows though are the most interesting and they got transplanted to Ascension of Our Lord in Laplace. And what is so fascinating to me about these windows is that they're very old and they're made by a maker that I have never heard of before or run into a sense in any church. And I photograph a lot of this stuff. The artist's name is Charles de Grange and he worked in Clermont Ferrand, France, making stained glass in the 1870s primarily. I was not able to find a single book about him in English, but luckily for me, I found one in French and I have a French friend who lives in Nice. And he translated the sections of the book for me that pertain to De Grange and gave me uh, enough information to pretty much make an unequivocal case of when these were produced. And it is indeed around uh, 1870. I absolutely love these windows. So I have a great uh, number of examples uh, to show you here. Uh, and you can also see the maker's marks on the left side there that indicate uh, the place of origin and uh, the artist's name. This church goes up in 2001. Blitch Nebel is a really uh, highly regarded contemporary architectural firm that's done quite a few designs uh, in the New Orleans, uh, Louisiana area. And we're seeing, looking mostly at saints. I don't know if you'll notice in the last frame, there was a King Wenceslas and you don't see him portrayed on stained glass very often. So that's a, a really interesting uh, uh, portrayal there. And uh, St. Anthanasius, I'm not sure who that is. I haven't heard of that saint. I've got to look him up. And we got St. Basil on the right. And oh, there was a few others uh, beforehand. I hope you got a good look at them. But this lecture will be posted uh, again in the, uh, in, the, in the near future. So you can take a closer look at that time if you like. So a lot of people, now that they know I've put out a book about New Orleans, uh, especially New Orleanians, the, one of the first questions they asked me about it is what are the top collections in town? And I definitely have opinions. And to me, what makes a, a collection uh, to be considered among the top is when there's more than one maker present. Now, sometimes this can give an incongruous look to the interior of a church, but I kind of look that, like that chaotic look where there's a lot of different styles going on at the same time. You're the kind of person that really cherishes organization in the design of a church, you probably prefer a place that has installations by a single maker that are all stylistically congruous. But my favorite places, are places that have multiple makers represented. And the first example we're gonna look at is Trinity Episcopal on Jackson Avenue uptown. 
And you'll see on the left side that we've got uh, six makers represented. And this is very carefully archived in a hardcover book published uh, by a member of the church a few years back that uh, teaches me most of the things I know about the stained glass uh, at this location. Conic was based in Boston, a really uh, highly reputed American maker. This is uh, right over your head as you walk in the front door of the church uh, in the area uh, that would be called uh, the Narthex, I believe. Uh, J and R Lamb, also super reputable makers with uh, uh, installations all over the United States. Uh, a couple of large Lancet windows here inside the main sanctuary. But the remainder of these uh, contributors here are guys, uh, uh, studios that I had personally never heard of before I opened the book that uh, one of Trinity Episcopal's members uh, wrote. So not saying they're super rare or anything, but they're definitely more rare than Lamb and Connick uh, examples. Here we see J.P. Spencer of Montreal. But we're going to finish off and move on to our uh, next church now, which is Christ Church Cathedral and Chapel right next to each other uh, on St. Charles uh, Avenue uptown. And these are built one right after the other between 1886 and 1889. In the main church, uh, we get like four uh, different, five different companies uh, represented here. And you can see uh, what a visual feast uh, this, uh, uh, this building is and how easy it is to tolerate an uninteresting sermon here because you can always just look at the glass if you so choose. So uh, this uh, triple lampset window is uh, manufactured by uh, Burnham Studio. If you go asking at their offices, they've got a great pamphlet that uh, uh, gives all the years of installation. I can't get too deep into it. We're limited on time, but you can find out the information through my book or uh, by going to this church if you care to. Uh, here's a Willett Studios example that I believe is in the chapel. And I really love Willett because they dominate Detroit churches, churches that have fancy uh, stained glass uh, installations in Detroit uh, that are built between like say 1920 and 1970. Usually they choose Willett Studios as their uh, stained glass fabricators and designers. Alfons Friedrich and Bro are quite, quite rare because they're a very old company. So a lot of buildings, their glass has been installed uh, in over the years have been torn down. So it's always a pleasure to find uh, one of their uh, examples. But the most interesting window between these two church buildings, in my opinion, is without a doubt the Belcher Mosaic Glass Company's window in the choir practice room that you have to ask someone to take, take you to. It's not in the main sanctuary, but Belcher used a real unique uh, fabricating process that no one's doing these days. And not, I, to my knowledge, no one was doing their, their, during their time. It was proprietary and no one was really trying to copy them. So when you see a Belcher window, it has a super unique look that's very easily identifiable at first glance, as uh, is the case with this window. Uh, Metairie Cemetery is another phenomenal place to find a lot of glass. Uh, uh, most people know about New Orleans, uh, you know, great uh, legacy of cemeteries, but only Metairie has enough affluent uh, interments uh, that they ended up having a huge collection of stained glass to look at there. And I really love traipsing this uh, cemetery, tugging on mausoleum doors, seeing, seeing if I can sometimes get an interior shot. And, you know, sometimes you get lucky. And I encourage you to be super respectful if you ever try that uh, yourself. I feel like uh, people that uh, care about New Orleans cemeteries uh, are very thoughtful about things of that nature. And I tried to be so as well uh, as I undertook this project. Uh, here's just a few examples. Uh, we never, we not never, but very rarely get to find out the maker when we're exploring Metairie. There's very few maker's marks, or sometimes you're observing the window uh, from an angle or from just a slit in the door where you can't really uh, get any of the information if it happens to be present. Uh, probably my favorite window in the entire cemetery is the Dibbert Mausoleum that I uh, did enter to make this photograph, and I felt like I had been the first person in there since about 1975. Uh, the, uh, the artist for this window is actually mentioned in a book about New Orleans architecture, and that's where my attribution comes from, which is really quite rare for windows here at the cemetery, so I'm uh, glad to learn that name. Uh, we also find a great example uh, in two places at two different mausoleums, the Siegler and Schmidt mausoleum that had identical identical memorial glass uh, installed. Uh, maybe my favorite mausoleum in the entire cemetery is the McCann Mausoleum. It goes up around the time of McCann's death in 1893. And not only does it feature a wonderful 
uh, very unique window. It's also just got some amazing architectural sculpture on the outside, and I'm a huge architectural sculpture fan. Finally, at the uh, All Saints Mausoleum, I believe on the far south side of the uh, of the cemetery's grounds, we find Metairie Cemetery. There's quite a few examples here by an older company from uh, Britain named Jay Whipple, but a few of those windows got blown out during Katrina and got replaced with con uh, contemporary windows by Reinhardt Studio of Winona, Minnesota. And uh, this is probably my favorite one, uh, the most worthy of your observation among their collection there. We can't, uh, I'm sorry, I guess that was also not my last installation, uh, my last uh, uh, mention for uh, uh, best uh, you know, collections in town, you can't do a best collection without mentioning St. Louis Cathedral because it's so central to the New Orleans experience. It's the uh, heart of the French Quarter and, you know, uh, the heart of the tourist experience in New Orleans. But because it's so frequented by tourists, there's actually a lot less freedom of movement inside of the church that we find at other locations in New Orleans. So my archive of uh, a stained glass photography is actually quite uh, limited. They still do have quite a few different uh, makers represented though. Uh, these two radius windows I shot from the outside, so I have no idea who the makers might be. I, not, I did not get a chance to look for corporate insignia. Uh, but inside the uh, main sanctuary, we have a series uh, of uh, radius windows by the Ointment Studios of Linux, Germany, which is quite a prolific maker of that era. And they depict scenes from the life of the King of France for whom uh, this cathedral is named. There's also a Ruth Galois example somewhere inside, but I, I never got a chance to find it or photograph it. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to finish up the lecture now, folks, with Detroit Connections, and I love talking about these because each time I found one in your city, uh, I was super surprised and pleased uh, to find it. Uh, we're going to start off with St. Joseph Catholic Church, which, could, which I could have just as easily included in the top collections uh, department because they do have uh, more than uh, two makers represented here. There's uh, some Meyer windows uh, in the upper levels and the lower levels. We have some Oitman, Oitman windows, uh, and there's also a handful of really great pieces by makers that I have not determined. What does it have in common with Detroit, though? You're probably asking. Well, the architect, Patrick Charles Keeley, he was an East Coaster that got hired to produce churches, church designs all over the United States over the course of his career. And one of them uh, is right here in Detroit, a really uh, famously historic church uh, that was uh, built in the earlier part of Keeley's career in 1855, 1856. I've never gotten inside this church, so I can't show off any of the stained glass to you, uh, but uh, it is a, a small connection, but a connection uh, nonetheless. Uh, inside St. Joseph uh, at 1802 Tulane Avenue, uh, we'll find, again, Franz Mayer and company windows in the upper levels. There's a lot of these uh, trip pick designs here, uh, mostly biblical scenes. And then we have a series of saints uh, executed by the Ointman Studios of Linux uh, on the lower level. But I think uh, probably my favorite window in the church, I just really love the expression on uh, St. Joseph's face here. This is uh, when St. Joseph is told by an angel that his wife is pregnant and that God is the father of the, of the upcoming son. And this occurs at a well in the biblical story. And I just feel like this is really beautifully rendered, but I was never able to find a corporate insignia on this series of windows, so I can't tell you who actually made it. Also, I never got up in the choir loft, but I did take a shot of this rose window in their choir loft from the lower levels, and I ended up loving it so much that it became the cover of my book. And uh, I didn't go up in the choir loft to look for a corporate insignia, so I can't say for certain this is a Meyer window, but it uh, uh, most likely is, in my personal opinion. Let's now head to the north side of the lake, the St. Peter Catholic Church. This is built in 1940, and lo, let's look at who the architects are, Tol Toledano, Wogan, and Bernard. Well, who designed uh, that church? I'm sorry, the addition to Jesuit High School in 1953? Well, it was Wogan and Bernard, too. So I'm guessing some of you who've been paying attention, you're going to know what the Detroit uh, connection is here. And we'll give that to you in just a second. But first, let's look at the window. Windows, pretty modern radius window designs by the Emil Fry uh, company installed, uh, manufactured and installed in two different eras from the 1940s to the 1960s. 
uh, a really nice, pretty modern looking uh, rose window there as well. Uh, but what I really love the most about this church is the sculpture on the outside uh, rendered by my all time favorite sculptor, Corrado Parducci, uh, you know, who, you know, is one of the reasons I originally started visiting New Orleans to find out about his commissions there. So uh, these are really great renderings uh, of St. Peter that are exactly in Parducci style. And I made these photographs, I believe, uh, on Mardi Gras uh, 2019. Got great light in the evening there that night. Uh, and this is my very last Detroit connection, folks. And I just absolutely love talking about this church. Originally known as St. John's Evangelical Lutheran, uh, this was built in 1903, 1904. It's in the Tulane Gravier uh, section of town, but it's deconsecrated. It has a private owner now, and you know they don't have religious activities at this building anymore. And for that reason, I had to hang out around this church uh, numerous times over the course of my five months in New Orleans in 20, uh, uh, 2020 when I was uh, gathering the photography and research for the book. And well, I would hang out for that long because I was hoping that the owner would come by and I would do this just about every week for about five months I would even pass out my business card to neighbors saying hey this guy comes by please uh, hand him my card and tell him I'll give him a few bucks to let me uh, shoot the stained glass from the inside well unfortunately that never happened but I got good enough exterior shots that it is included uh, in the book but here's what's so fascinating about uh, its connection to Detroit uh, the vast majority of New Orleans churches built in this time and that you find in my book, there's an architectural att attribution for almost all of them. But despite all the super dig deep digging I did on this church over the course of my research, never once found an architect, not in a New Orleans item article, not in a Times Picayune article, not in an architecture of New Orleans a book uh, write up that you see there at the bottom. Uh, and it got really frustrating to me because I wanted to identify an architect. Well, one night in uh, 2019, while I was doing some completely unrelated research on an architectural duo, duo from Detroit, this clipping pops up before my eyes. Church for New Orleans. Architects Spear and Rones are preparing plans for a brick and stone church for St. John's Ev Evangelical Lutheran Congregation of New Orleans. Some time ago, the pastor of this church saw an illustration in the Sunday Free Press of a church designed by architect Spear and Rones, and it was due to this incident that these gentlemen were commissioned to prepare the plans for their building. So this just absolutely blew me away when I found this clipping, and I was just uh, so pleased. I was telling people about it uh, for days, and a lot of people probably don't care. So that was uh, really fun telling them that story. You can get a sense of how prolific and how important uh, Spear and Rones are to the Detroit experience by examining this uh, list of commissions uh, I've uh, included on the right side. Maybe the most important one there is the Detroit Chamber of Commerce building, which is actually the oldest standing skyscraper in downtown Detroit. But uh, they've got a ton of great extant designs around here. And it's just amazing to me that they ended up uh, uh, designing a church in your home city. And I was able to get good enough uh, stained glass shots from the outside that I thought it was worthy of inclusion in the book and I just uh, loved being able to include it. That concludes my lecture, folks. Oh, one more thing. I wanna tell you where you can find my book locally. It's available uh, in paperback only uh, at dale-a-carlson.squaresite. I get the best return and the highest royalty rate of any of my uh, different spots where I sell at that site. So if you could buy there, I'd greatly appreciate it. But if you want to support a local retailer, you can find it at the Catholic Bookstore over by uh, over uh, far uptown, uh, Octavia Books, Newcomb Art Museum, Preservation Resource Center in the CBD, uh, the Shrine of Our Lady of Prompt Sucker, I would guess has a few copies left, National Shrine of Blessed Francis Xavier Silos is right over there by St. Mary's Assumption and, uh, you know, uh, oh, St. Alphonsus. Uh, Frenchman Art and Books. Oops, I'm supposed to say French men, not man. Sorry, a little typo there. I love having my book at that location because Frenchman uh, Street, I consider one of the beating hearts of American culture and absolutely love hanging around that area. And also right next to St. Louis Cathedral, you can find a single copy at Faulkner House Books uh, that I hope moves one of these days.
That concludes my lecture, folks. I hope you've enjoyed what you've learned tonight. And I would now like to open uh, the floor to questions. If uh, you want to get that started, Amanda. Yeah, thank you so much. That was like, that was incredible. That was, well, I mean, I learned a ton of stuff that I didn't know. And uh, okay, let's get going. Um, Y'all can raise your hand um, using the Zoom controls or you can uh, type your question in chat. If you raise your hand, I can unmute you if you prefer to ask your uh, question out loud. But for now, I will read the questions in the chat and let's get started. So Dale, the first question is from Jessica Pino. She asks, when a window is commissioned, does the maker have free reign to create the subject as they see fit, or is the design mapped out with the buyer beforehand? So there's a lot of different answers to that question, and uh, fabrication and the design process is a little bit uh, outside of my area of expertise. I'm more about the history of the buildings and the, uh, you know, the architects and, uh, uh, you know, who the designers were at that time. Uh, but I don't really follow super closely uh, those kind of uh, uh, business dealings that lead up to the installation. But I can tell you that in many cases, especially in the Catholic Church, that oftentimes the, the clergy has the original vision and dictate to uh, the uh, studio that they commission what they would like to see incorporated as subject matter uh, in the church. But, you know, some artists, uh, they get so significant and they get so important and they get so much respect that they can get to certain points in their career, uh, you know, where for them to accept the commission, they want to have some input uh, in the content and, uh, and, and what ends up being their creation. So I can't speak to specific instances uh, where that is the case from church to church in New Orleans. Uh, but I can direct you to, A, if there's a church you have a specific interest in, Catholic churches almost always have a written history uh, that they will share with you, uh, either digitally or, in many cases, they just straight up gave me a book somebody in their congregation wrote over the years. Uh, and they can be very generous with that kind of thing if you have a genuine interest. That's one place you can go to find out. Sometimes newspaper accounts might fill in a little bit of that uh, uh, kind of information. but. Uh, uh, you know, I, I can't help but wonder, me and Amanda were talking, Amanda and I were talking about this before our lecture, actually, if maybe there's more of a research trove held by the Archdiocese of New Orleans that I was never able to access over the course of my research. And that might be a place where you can find some more uh, answers to that, too. But my personal answer, most often, the clergy at a given church uh, has the most say uh, at what is going to be incorporated uh, in the windows. But, you know, there's a lot of exceptions to that. That makes that makes perfect sense. Um, I, I dropped a little uh, kind of like, you know, the book could use a little love. It seems to be about the history of stained glass. Perhaps they might mention like some of the common reasons that people did. But I think like exactly what you said, it was it was almost certainly dictated by, you know, like the vision and, um, you know, direction of the church. So um, let us see here. Um, do we have more questions? Does anybody else want to ask anything? It looks like there's 10 in the chat there, Amanda. Oh, we got, well, oh, the hands raised. I'm sorry, y'all. Where are they? I'm not seeing it. Oh, no. Okay. It looks like, it looks like most of uh, the comments in the chat yeah, I have a fantastic job. Thank you. <laughs> Are your comments, actually. Yeah, okay. Um, hey, well, there's only one question. There's only one question. What can you do? Well, um, in that case, uh, unless uh, somebody wants to um, pop in the chat before we leave, um, I want to thank you for this, Dale. It was it was incredibly educational. I want to- My pleasure. Uh, Again, I've dropped the link to Dale's website, and he has a list of places to purchase the book. And also, um, we have three copies at the library that you're welcome to request as well if you're in the New Orleans area, um, if you have a New Orleans Public Library card. Um, and of course, um, he mentioned so many things that, like, you know, uh, touch on our collections. Um, Please, like what you learned here tonight, feel free to drop it into the search at our um, at the City Archives website. Let me put it in the chat right now. 
We're always available um, to answer questions as well. And, and Dale, I'm always happy to field questions from our viewers um, and uh, forward them to you. So Great. Uh, the conversation hey. will continue. Thank you so much for having me uh, tonight, Amanda. I really love giving this lecture and I really love the city of New Orleans and I can't wait to get back there again. Uh, uh, maybe we'll have a, a second edition uh, in the coming years. I mean, it, I, I just wanna say it's so obvious from your work and everything you presented today that like the love is so deep and abiding. I, I really appreciated all of the detail and everything that you presented for us. And so did everybody else. Thank you, everybody. Yes, appreciate the compliments, folks. Thank you.